Hi, everyone. Welcome. I am Maria Russo. I'm the children's books editor at the New York Times Book Review. And I am so happy to welcome here to the National Book Festival. Uh, and we're grateful to the Library of Congress for making this possible, Marisha Pessel. Hello. <laughs> Who, um, Thank you so much. It's so great to have you here. And you're here on the YA stage. Yes. Which is a new place for Marisha. Um, you guys uh, probably know Marisha as a adult, an adult fiction writer. Her new book, Neverworld Wake, is her first foray into YA. And the big question people always have about any YA writer, but especially one who came like you from the, the world of, of adult fiction, where your books, Special Topics in Calamity Physics, and the second one, who um, night film, uh, I was supposed to say night train, night film um, were so well received and, and considered you know, such incredible works of fiction. Why would an author decide to write for teenagers and write, decide to write YA? So that is my first question for you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for being here and to all of you. Um, it's actually something that I, I always knew that I wanted to write for children, even before I published my first novel. Um, books were such an important part of me as a young, uh, as a young person. Um, first and foremost, I'm a reader even before I'm a writer. So um, I always knew that I wanted to contribute to that space at some point. I didn't know how or when. I just knew um, at some point an idea would strike me that seemed at home more in the YA space than in the adult space. So about two years ago or so, I was working on my third adult novel when I had the idea of this um, very claustrophobic, tight-knit group of former high school students stuck not only in a remote location, but also stuck in time. And there was just something about the nature of the story that felt um, that it needed to be YA, simply because the, um, the age of the teenagers, I wanted them just a little bit removed from that, um, you know, the pressure cooker of high school. So I really set out um, to write this book as a side project and, um, and was very excited to enter this space. And it really grew, it grew and became, um, we should talk a little bit about the plot of the novel, just um, if anyone here has had a chance to read it yet. Um, and if not, we're hoping you'll pick it up and Marisha will do some signing. Yes, right, I'll be signing. After. So as Marisha said, it's, it's set the year after the main characters have graduated from high school. They are going back to the house where they spent a lot of time together yes. when they were in high school. And um, can you give us your elevator pitch of what <laughs> happens when they, when they all, yes. five of them? Yes, assemble. so one year after um, they've graduated high school, um, they all return for a reunion of sorts. Um, to a remote estate belonging to one of them. And they were all very tight-knit in high school, but the death of the sixth member of their group really tore them all apart. So our main character, Beatrice, returns hoping, um, a year later, hoping to get some questions. And as all big moments in one's mind, the reality never matches with what you've hoped. So um, after a series of... Um, short conversations where she's really not getting to the bottom of you know what exactly happened to the sixth member of their group. Um, they have a near-death collision and they survive and return home and that is when a stranger knocks on the door and announces that they've entered the Neverworld Wake. You really have to read the book to find out what this is. But um, it is a break in the space-time continuum where they relive the same hours over and over again. And um, that is really how the novel unfolds. They have to figure out how to free themselves. Really, what, what was so cool to me about this book is how it reads like realism. Like, you really believe these Thank people you. exist. And yet, uh, as you can see, it's actually a work of high fantasy. <laughs> it's, it's a time travel, um, time-space continuum uh, plot. 
So how did you balance those two, those two genres? How do, you do, how do you make it seem so realistic when they're jumping around in time, they're living the same day over and over again? There's all kinds of... Yes, so um, I always put my, I mean, I think with all novels, I, you know, even when there is an element of fantasy, I want it to be grounded in reality as if this is actually happening. So it's really just a question of putting yourself in, in that um, circumstance and figuring out how it's going to unfold as if you are actually there. And the idea started from the standpoint of an unsolved mystery. And I was struck by the idea that some mysteries are unsolved simply because of the parameters of a human life and that we can't possibly synthesize all an amount of information in a, a given lifespan. And we also only have 24 hours a day to work with. So I was thinking, what if that changed and someone had infinity, or at least the perception of infinity, to solve this mystery? So it really came from there. And um, of course, there's an element of Groundhog Day, which was one of my favorite movies. And Groundhog Day is such an endemic part of our culture. It's just like another kind of conceit to use. So I was thinking, like, you know, um, you know, getting beyond that. So the characters are reliving it and they have their um, different experiences of what that means. But I always wanted to push and see um, from a psychological standpoint what's beyond um, simply being trapped in time, like, you know, how that is going to unfold. You know, now that you mention it, it's, it's reality, it's science fiction, but it also is mystery. You're right, because <laughs> right. when they go back and relive each day, they're trying out different mm -hmm. theories about this murder. They're trying to get more information in yes. an, inc an increasingly outrageous. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's just a lot of, because as they have, at a certain point, they realize the stakes are so low. If they shoot someone, if they shoot themselves, <laughs> the next day they wake up and everything's the same. So right. the, the, the plot gets really kind of totally wild by, right, by the right, end. Right. But, in the, but you are following the rules of a murder mystery. Too. Yes, I mean, I think I have such a love affair with the murder mystery as an idea, because I think it's my Trojan horse to explore other elements of what it means to be human. Um, you can go really deep within the conceit of a murder mystery. Um, and I'm a big Ag Agatha Christie fan. She was actually one of my favorite authors, and still is in some, in some ways. Um, so I love to keep the audience guessing and have that sort of um, clockwork puzzle, but you can, within that, explore so many phenomenal themes with that narrative pull pulling the reader along. Right, right. And um, the other theme that really, really jumps out besides the sort of life, death, limits of a life, limits of a day, um, is this theme of friendship between these characters and how you think you know your friends so well, and this is, of course, taking place at a boarding school, so they really thought they knew each other. They lived with each other for many years, and then it turns out none of them knew any of the others really uh, yes. enough yes. at all. Yes, I mean, I think um, the longer I've been a writer, I'm just fascinated. Um, well, actually, when I was on book tour, someone asked me like, what I love and what I'm afraid of, and it's a human being, because human beings are capable from, for, for such a range of acts, um, benevolent and truly evil. So there's such a range within that. Um, and the more as a novelist you work on character and you work on human psychology, you realize you can never really get to the end of a human being in terms of the core of who someone is. Personality is so much influenced by time, circumstance, mood, whether or not someone's had a large lunch. I mean, it kind of all depends. So um, within this time frame of infinite time, um, what does it mean to like, continue to get to know somebody? And it, I mean, human beings are infinite. Well, that's kind of what I figured out in right, this book. Right, right. It does seem that way. The main character, Beatrice, especially, is an interesting study in this because she's, for most of the book, we sort of take her word and sort of assume that she's the good girl, right? She's the simple yeah. one that they all um, not necessarily look down on, but they all consider her, oh, boring, knowable Beatrice. Yes. And yes. then, in fact, we yes. learn at the end. Yes. Two fairly major uh, secrets, which we won't spoil. Yes, no spoilers. But yes, I mean, I think, especially in high school, it's so easy to really pigeonhole people as you were trying to make your own way as a young person. And even thinking back in my own life, um, you know, thinking back to all the different 
characters or people that I knew. I sort of made certain assumptions about them. And then later as an adult, I found out really what the reality was of what was going on in um, a friend of mine's house or what you know they were dealing with in a family situation. So you just really realize um, as a young person, there's such a huge universe that is out of sight and not within your daily experience. Um, and so I wanted to explore that. And I think um, the message is really, not that anything boils down to a message in the book, but um, it's about empathy and understanding that there's so much of a personal history that one does not know. So it allows really you to for high school, approach people uh, with a little bit more, um, I would say, uh, grace. Yeah for the possibilities that each yes. person holds. And another theme that, uh, if, as if there wasn't enough in this book already, uh, another theme I really liked that sort of snuck up on me at the end was a kind of feminist um, approach to, you know, men take women's words and women's work and take credit yeah. for it a lot. And as a woman, you have to be really careful. Are you helping? by giving your work away to men who get the credit and the glory, or are you destroying kind of both of you? Yes, I mean, I think, I'm so glad you picked up on that, because I've actually never talked about that before. But um, yes, I think I was inspired by the fact that throughout history, women, through their love, have supported um, so much and allowed others really to stand on their shoulders. So there are certainly elements. The idea of the, the male genius. Like we yes. start the book thinking there are these two male characters who are just kings of the world. Mm -hmm. yes. And it's not quite, all is not as it seems with yes. them either. Right, right, exactly. So there's, yeah, there's that um, really, that was one of those threads that you just kind of wove in there and then <laughs> hold at the very end. <laughs> Right. Well, some of it, it's interesting. Some of it is plot um, ahead of time. And then some of these elements of character that you're mentioning, or uh, some of it just sort of seep in um, kind of inadvertently. And, um, and so those are those things that you can't necessarily plan. That's true. Well, since you're mentioning this, people are always curious about a novelist's process. Could you describe what your typical you know, the, the journey of the manuscript is? Um, uh, yes, in a nutshell. So um, you, I always start out with um, some sort of gut idea. Um, and it's interesting. Sometimes I'll think I have an idea for a novel, but then it will wither really quickly over like three days when I'm starting to think about it. And I'm like, oh, it's not big enough. It's not um, strange enough, it's not wild enough, it's not different enough. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll put an idea like that aside or I'll just write it down and put it in a drawer somewhere. But um, so you start with the idea, and I really do a lot of um, research ahead of time in a novel with pen and paper and writing out characters and writing out plot points that seem um, unusual that I haven't seen before in a book or something that would be really thrilling. So just doing a lot of, uh, of that character work and plotting with pen and paper, like writing longhand. And then I'll start to develop really a Bible for the writing before I've really written on the computer Oh, like a yet. TV show Bible. Yeah, like a TV show Bible. And um, with character, plot points, a few visuals, definitely not like visuals of the characters, but things that allow me to get in a sense of the texture of the character, like the logo on their sweatshirt or what kind of shoes they would wear or, or um, you know, something that they would cut out of a magazine or something like that. So I kind of have a sense of each character. And then at that point, after maybe, I would say that's about a month's time, then I'll start the writing. And um, the writing is really just like an excavation. Like you just have to keep going deeper. And um, I was giving writing advice recently to someone who's writing a first novel and they're like worried about their opening paragraph. And I'm like, that opening paragraph is actually gonna be the final thing that you write. So don't even worry about what your first sentence is. Let's like, you know, dive in. And you're just like, you have to just keep digging and digging and digging. And then um, when you think you're finished, then you bring in your editor and then you'll realize you really just started. And um, <laughs> I, there's always a moment where I think I'm finished and the editor comes back to me and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's really funny. There, there's so much of writing that's complete psychological, like mind um, bending. You, you, you think something is good and then you come back later and you realize, whoa. So it's really just about coming back again and again, working with your editor and um, you know, allowing something to kind of solidify. Was, was this book easier than the first two? Does it get easier the third time? 
I don't think so. I mean, I think for me, I really like to challenge myself. If I think that something's easy, then I really think I'm way off. Um, so no, I think there was a speed to the writing. Um, because I did plot a lot of it out beforehand, so I was writing much faster than I wrote Special Topics or Night Film, um, but I also went back and probably wrote the book two more times. Wow, and was there yeah. anything especially helpful that your editor said or did? Oh, yes. I mean, I, I had a, as I was telling you before, I had a wonderful young adult editor. She's obviously different than my adult editor, and um, she was great. I mean, she's... I wouldn't even say that she's a young adult editor, she's just a great editor. So um, pushing me really on, um, push, she really pushed me on the emotional aspect of things. And I love that. Because sometimes I can get very into like, ooh, the, the, the cerebral puzzle part of it. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who pushed me with like the heart, the heart, the heart. Oh. It's harder for me to write those things because I, um, I I guess I, it, you know, to get the emotional element on the page. It's not just a question of putting on like a Whitney Houston song and like being like, oh, crying and then writing, because then your writing isn't very good. Uh, so it's really that emotional part is hard for me. That's interesting that you say that because that's another thing that kind of snuck up about halfway through the love story, oh, which okay, is right. always is sort of buried in the, you know, mm -hmm. that there was this relationship. Uh, but we don't hear anything about it. And then halfway through, you sort of open that up and you, you write a very beautiful oh, love story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Teenage, um, you know, teenage, um, the, the, the tragedy and, and wonder of, of right, teenage love right. feels like forever. Yeah, I mean, that is the hardest thing for me personally to write because um, it can be very painstaking and you have to get a lot of people to read it and see if something is reading. Some of it feels very surgical sometimes. I mean, it's not just, as I was saying before, just like an outpouring of how I feel as the writer. It has to be on the page. And sometimes you can feel emotional as a writer, and then it's not on the page. So there's a huge difference between That's what the writer is feeling and then advice. what's on there, yeah. Um, well, we are going to have some time for, for questions. But I had uh, one more thing I really wanted to ask about. Um, which is, so you, you've been talking with teenagers about this book, how has their reaction been and how has it been to be in this world of writing for teenagers? I love um, it, I love what, it. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've experienced? Yes, I mean, um, I will say, I, I'm, well, even starting out before the book even came out, entering this space and talking to teenage readers, um, I'm really struck by how books become such a part of their lives and how when they love something, it's really um, something that is very heartfelt in a way that with adults, actually that's not true, adults really love books too, but um, there's just something really pure about that relationship um, with books and adolescents. And I, it's very much reminds me of my own experience. So to return to that and, and also to see that um, the, the rumors of books' deaths are greatly exaggerated. Oh, especially if you look at the, the teenagers. I know, and, I know, I know. I the remember. The children's books exactly, are just this vibrant, exactly, vibrant exactly. part of our culture right now. And it right really now. gives me a great sense of, um, to, to be able to be a writer is just such an amazing thing. And it's an act of bravery. And it's an act of um, uh, giving to people a story and that they hopefully enjoy. It's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to do. So. For the young, um, for the, the next generation. Yes, yes. Um, have you uh, had a chance to develop other favorite current YA authors or? Um, yes, actually. Or cast? <laughs> um, well, so I will say my favorite books um, as a child were the Chronicles of Narnia, like C.S. Lewis. And um, now I'm, well, now I'm reading what's really popular, like Children of Blood and Bone, and oh, I'm so amazed so by her talent. And um, so, no, just, I guess I'm starting out. Do you have any recommendations? No, oh, boy, I have way, <laughs> way too many. <laughs> but um, uh, should, we, should we give the audience some time for, uh, for questions soon, or how, how are we doing on time? We have Oh, okay. oh, okay. Let's go. Let's do a few more questions. <laughs> a few more questions, and then we'll keep your keep oh, one, guys. Um, oh, that's right. She has cute guys. Okay, great. Um, what else can I ask you about? Okay, there's one other theme that I'm going to have to bring up that is a big theme of yours, and you handle it really well. But um, it's strong stuff, and it's and this is death. 
The way you write about death, to me, is unlike any other writer because you are so comfortable <laughs> with um, sort of the, the, the back and forth and the boundary between life and death. And this is a novel that has several, because of the repeating day, the characters die and die and die. <laughs> right. You wrote many, many death scenes right. for this right. book. And almost all of these characters get to experience death and, right. and tell us what death is like. Right. Um, right. So, so uh, could you talk a little bit about your, how do you approach writing about death? And did it feel different doing that for, for teenagers? Um, that's interesting. So how do I, I well, I think, I think a lot about death myself, I think. Um, simply because um, obviously it's the great mystery that we all wonder about. Um, but thinking of mortality gives one a certain freedom um, in your own action. So I'm, I think I'm fairly at ease with the idea. And, um, and it was exciting in this particular book to answer that question and to actually like write a death scene as I, would, as I believe it to have happened for certain people. So um, that was actually really exciting to be able to do. And, um, but no, I wouldn't, I, I certainly, when I was writing this book, did not change how I would write something for teens. Um, I didn't change anything about my writing style. I didn't change anything um, in terms of writing about death or life or anything. Um, I didn't want to, um, I guess, I didn't want to dumb down, certainly. And I, cert I also didn't want to um, shield um, my reader from a certain reality. I think that I think that the young adult audience can handle really everything yes. in terms of subject matter, and I think that they do. And um, and and I think adolescent and young readers can actually handle subjects better than adults sometimes <laughs> with and a, fact, a more open they mind. Think yeah. they, teenagers probably, I would say, think about death a lot. Yes, because death touches their lives. That you, yes. Right. And, there's one scene where um, one of your characters has a has a death experience, and I, I love this one so much because she, you know she describes what it's like, and then she says, "And finally, it was just joy." Right. I was like, "That was so comforting." And right. <laughs> right. Well, and also I think I was inspired by my own grandmother's death, when, especially when I was writing night film, um, because my I was raised by my grandmother, and she passed away at 101 when I was writing night film, and um, and just seeing her in that process really. Um, had a huge impact on me, and um, and I felt that there was joy, and that was really my interpretation of being with her in those times. But um, there was a sadness to let go, but then there was a letting go, and um, there was joy. So I put that in the book. And and as you said, not that the book is messagey at all, but there is an in implicit message in that, and I think in the book, which is that. Um, live your life, because we, are, we all know death is right there, live your life with purpose and meaning and joy. Yes, and I think about that too. I think and anytime I'm afraid to try something, especially in, in terms of writing a book, um, I just think we're all headed to the same point, so why not um, you know, really climb the highest mountain and, and see how far one can go. So. And you've, you've certainly done that. Uh, well, I don't thank know about that, but thank you. <laughs> well, we do have, we are now at our 10-minute at our mark, so um, do we have some questions for Marisha? Do you want me to go to the microphone, or I can use my teacher voice? Oh, uh, <laughs> the teacher voice sounds good. You have a wonderful voice, so uh, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I absolutely love your first two books. Oh, thank you so Very much. But you said first and foremost that you are a reader before a writer, and I know you already mentioned that Agatha Christie was one of your favorite books. Yes. But I was curious what other writers have influenced your writing. Certainly. I mean, when I was a teenager, and really even now, I read everything I can get my hands on. Um, so I was an English literature major in college. So. Um, I mean, obviously, the greats like Charles Dickens. Um, I went through a real um, obsession with Nabokov at the time that I was writing um, uh, Special Topics. So um, I would say Charles Dickens primarily because of just the sheer boisterous nature of, that, of his novels and just how much one can do within 
um, a story in terms of the corporality of the characters or um, addressing social issues and um, this big boisterous tapestry to create. I mean, I always loved that idea. Um, more contemporary at the time, um, I loved Jonathan Franzen and Jeffrey Eugenides and American literary fiction maybe 10 years ago I was really obsessed with. Um, but now I'm going back to the classics too and it's always good to just read a wide range. Um, the high, the low, the genre, the literary. You were saying The Secret Garden. Oh yes, The that, Secret Garden. Oh, and Peter is. Pan. And now I, I have children, so now I'm revisiting those those children's classics, oh, and they're just unbelievable. Great. The Little Princess. I mean, all of these like amazing books that, yeah. and some of them are and actually Little Women too. Yes. Yeah. I just started watching the PBS Little Women. You have to watch it. I have to watch. That. Very good. Any any other questions? For oh. The light is so bright. Okay, hi. We see you. Can you. So, how challenging was it having a plot where, like, of course, emotionally it would matter the next day what they had done, but physically, like, it didn't matter what they did. Like, you had so much room to do anything you want there. So, how, how did you do that in your book? You mean in terms of having so much choice because of the infinity nature of the time? Yeah. That's such a good question. So um, I had to limit myself, and I allowed the characters to tell me their limits because I was bound by the nature of these characters. And so characters kept me to a grounded place as to what they were going to do. Beatrice was going to actually try to get everyone to vote. She was the responsible one. She was the one who really wanted to try this. Um, um, I won't go into all of them without, tell I don't want to give away too much, but um, I was bound by character. And I have found no matter what, character is what you always return to as a writer. Whether you're, going, you're writing a huge sprawling epic or a tiny little thing, your characters are bound by their sheer nature of mortality, their circumstance. Um, it's really all about character, and that's the wonderful thing, and that really keeps you as a writer grounded. Um, because you're writing about people. That's why I don't think I'm ever, I won't limit myself, but to write about aliens or something, I, then there would be no limits and it would truly be scary. But um, people, I can handle. People have a corporality, they have a, um, something I can handle. So that's, what I, that's how I dealt with that infinity. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else want to step up to that mic? Back I've there. got a question. Um, actually, I've got a couple of confessions. Oh, here's one here. A couple of confessions and a, and a, and a question. My first confession is I, I haven't yet read the, the new book, so I don't, know, I don't know if my question will quite apply to that to the okay. new book. But my other confession is that you're, it's a little bit disarming because you have exactly the same mannerisms as an ex-girlfriend of mine, and she's also a, <laughs> and she's also a writer, oh, no. so I'm kind of like, I'm kind of freaking I'm out. <laughs> That's right. But um, my question is, uh, in the first two books, you, you do a lot of, um, you, obviously night film is a lot about, about movies. Mm -hmm. And so do you, like, do you think about movies in the same way, or, and do you enjoy movies the same way that you said, like, you're a reader first? Is, are, is film a, bi a big uh, influence on, on your writing? Do, do you have a favorite genre of film, uh, fa favorite directors? Does that kind of you know, work into your, into, your, uh, into your books? Yes, so I... Um, well, so I grew up with a mom who was obsessed with classic cinema. So when my friends were out like at a normi normal movie theater, my mom and I would be watching like Turner classic movies and I would be watching like Howard Hawks and Preston Sturges and um, His Girl Friday and obsessed with Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart, Alfred Hitchcock. So um, that was another way for me to really get through my adolescence was, you know, a, loving these like old movies where people had shoulder pads and cigarette holders and James Cagney and all these like crazy characters. Um, so certainly like, you know, like all influences in, in childhood, like that will play out in one's art in different ways. Um, of, certainly with night film, um, the, or, or, the original, the, the originating idea for that um, was really Stanley Kubrick and reading about the behind the scenes um, behavior that he really exerted on his surroundings, all in the name of art and um, the sort of 
various means of torture that different actors would sign up for simply to be in a Kubrick film. And I just found that so interesting. Um, why were people allowing themselves to be treated like this? And was it for the fame? Was it for um, to get outside of their day-to-day -day existence, which maybe was dreary, and they wanted to go off to sort of adult camp and have some sort of experience? So I really started reading about um, these you know, usually male film directors and how they were allowed um, and enabled to like, create art. And art that we love, I mean, I love Alfred Hitchcock, and then it's uh, subsequently come out as to how he actually treated people behind the set, so, um, behind the scenes. So I really, that was my originating idea. Um, so certainly my childhood was all about books and movies, but you know, books are, that's my centerpiece, that's my love. Oh, two, two minutes. Can I ask who is your favorite character in the book? Oh, in Neverwill? Yeah, because I think it's it definitely quite Martha. Clear. Definitely oh, Martha. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I love them all. I mean, yeah, even so my characters are bad. They're all really lovable. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm can't, I can't see with the lights, but anyone else? Any oh, here we are. Yes. Can you the oh, say that again? He's saying, could the new book have been no, an adult I think novel? It, well, actually, adults who've read it have said that it's not necessarily YA. And we were actually talking about this, like what makes something young adult. I always conceived it as young adult simply because um, the age of the main characters. And when I started working with my young adult editor, she really said, um, because of the age of the characters, it makes it young adult. But then Maria said. One, one uh, rule of thumb that some people use is, that if it's just about teenagers, but it's for grown-ups, there will be a sense of looking back on what happened from the grown-up perspective, and there'll be sort of signposts showing that this, these characters went on to adult lives that is sort of the present. Whereas uh, in a YA book, you know, these characters really are, you're in the perspective of teenagers. You don't know what your future is going to hold. You don't know if you're going to even survive into adulthood. Right. So, so I think this does, in some ways, it's classic YA in, the, in that right. sense that it's not retrospective. Um, but, you know, there's, as everyone here probably knows, YA is a new category. It didn't exist when, you know, Catcher in the Rye and The Outsiders, you know, these were just books. And it's sort of a new phenomenon to call, to rope these off and call them YA. So yeah. everybody should read YA, what's called YA. And in fact, people say, the publishing industry will tell you 50% of YA readers are actually grown-ups. Exactly. So, right. I'm sure lots of you I think it started with the Harry Potter phenomenon. Right. Everyone wants exactly. to go back and read these stories that they get lost in. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up. Anyone wanna sneak in a last speed dating kind of question? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, it will be shortly. I'm finishing it up, and that's about all I can tell you. But is it coming. the one you discarded the earlier idea? Oh no, no, no. no. That, I, so, so no, that was another one. young adult idea. So it's no, I did not discard this idea. Definitely not. So it's coming your way, but um, stay tuned for more. I'm very excited. Did we get everybody who wanted a? We have probably we could sneak in one more. Any other questions? Oh, here we are. Yes. In the Hi. Did you have a question in the pink? Hi. Are you going to make another Yes, yes, I definitely am. So my, my plan is to switch. So I'm going to write my next adult, and then um, I'm already working on a new young adult. So definitely. So you're going to go back and forth? I think I'm going to go back and forth. That is good news for <laughs> everyone in this room. <laughs> Why leave when it's so nice here? Right. I'm not going to leave. Yes. So um, yes, I'm definitely writing another young adult book. And um, more news on that soon. Well, fantastic. Well, Marisha Pestle, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Maria, so this much for such an honor. Wonderful. And